Okay, you can share your screen so we can try to start if you are good with that. We lost you in a minute, that's good. Everything fine? You are muted? If you can hear us? Uh, related to different topics. 
uh, mostly like peace building, also uh, gender equalities, inclusion, etc. Great. Uh, hello, my name is Sumeya. I am a uh, faculty of health studies uh, student and I study uh, laboratory uh, technologies. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Mayla. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a student at the Faculty of Health Studies too, and I'm studying um, laboratory technology. Great, yeah, so um, so far we have a great mix of science and, um, and social science. Um, so that's wonderful to see. And we have people online now. We have uh, Sandra online. Samuel, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, I was just, uh, uh, yeah, I found a book up like 10 minutes ago, so sorry. Uh, I'm in London, so I have one hour left than you. Uh, I mean, it was uh, like uh, earlier in the morning for me. So uh, thank you for being here today with us. Um, I'm impressed with uh, what you sent us, and I'm looking forward to hear uh, more and I'm really very happy every Saturday when we have these interesting talks because I'm trying to incorporate the gender dimension in my PhD. Uh, I work in the Embassy of Bosnia and Herzegovina in London. I uh, had one master uh, in 2010 and I'm finishing my second master now. And uh, not to be too long, all of my themes, uh, including the theme of my PhD, are very much connected with youth in Bosnia and Herzegovina education system in Bosnia and Herzegovina as I think that the crucial uh, 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 moment and dimension that can really make a difference for a better future of Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's wonderful, Samra. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure you're also engrossed in uh, watching the meltdown of the Tory party in, because yeah, you are yeah. in it's, it's very uh, interesting to live here in this moment of history. I mean, people are like exchanging with the revolving doors, like new door on the downing, the downing, uh, 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 you know, number 10 uh, street. And it's very, um, you know, it's interesting, but at the same time, I'm I'm thrilled that uh, you know uh, people can make the change if they think they are necessary. So, yeah, it's the same thing that we should do in Bosnia. You know, making the changes that are necessary for our future. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, lots of lessons there. Sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Dina, uh, would like to bring you in now. Okay, Dina, we'll get a translator on um, for you to introduce yourself. Um, so, so that's fine. Okay, colleagues, uh, now that um, we have all said hello to one another in this uh, lovely Saturday morning, um, we're going to proceed as follows. So, for the next uh, little while, let's say about 30 minutes or thereabouts. I will uh, give a kind of a talk on gender and excellence in research, after which we will stop and have some uh, questions and answers. Um, and at about um, 5 to 11 year time, which is 5 to 10 for me and Samra, um, we will have a coffee break for about 15 minutes. And then we will come back at uh, 10 past 11 or so and we will have a conversation um, and what I will ask you to do is address a question um, so the people who are in the room will have that conversation themselves and the people online will have that conversation uh, themselves um, and maybe I can participate in the online one um, and then um, we will have, after 20 minutes, we will have a report back. So the people in the room will say of what they spoke about, and the people online will say what they spoke about, 
and we will draw all the threads together and uh, close for the day. Okay, so we should finish at about uh, 12 o'clock or so and um, that will be uh, obviously 11 o'clock uh, uh, for uh, Samra and myself. So is that okay with everyone? Yeah, great, okay. So I will now try and share my screen. Um, this doesn't always work and I don't usually use Google Meets, so fingers crossed <laughs> this works. Uh, present. Presentation. Can you can you see that? Uh, yes, great, we can. You can yes, that's you're good. Okay. good. Can um I wonder if I can make it um full Yes you can. Uh, Just press F five. F five. Yes. And it should function. Yeah. I, I just need to look at my screen. Yeah. No, maybe I press Control A five. F five. Yep. Or just click. Um. Yes, here. Give me some white space, please. She tried already F five. The right corner. Okay, try. So here. Okay, let's try. Um, the right corner. Yes, just there when you're that, 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 that one, one, yes, just press it. Good. Yep. Oh, there we go. Uh, can you see that now? Can, can you see the screen? No. Yeah? Not yet. We can see the presentation, but not in the full screen. But still, it's okay. Oh. Ah, because um, it shows a full screen for me. So I apologize. I'm not. I mean, this this is, it doesn't, doesn't work. work. <laughs> so is, is it still okay? It's okay. We can oh. see everything fine as a girl. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. That's great. Then if I keep it in this um, in this way, I can also see uh, you as well. So maybe that's that's best. Yeah. Okay. And um, on those slides, I uh, have sent to. Amina for sharing with you afterwards. So um, don't worry about uh, trying to uh, make notes of uh, of what of the slides. Okay. So um, first of all, I want to thank um, Mirza and Amina for the invitation to share thoughts with you on the subject of gender in research. And I'm going to uh, speak to that today with a focus on excellence. And first of all, before I begin, I want to thank and to commend the initiative of the homework hall, Mirza, Amina, and all the wonderful colleagues there for your amazing initiative in bringing the homework hall into being. It truly is a, re a, a service to higher education in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, as I said, my subject today is gender and excellence in research. As a feminist researcher, I have long been interested in three things. One is the position of women in academic research. Two is the manner in which feminist research is perceived by our peers. And three, in the way that bringing a gender lens to bear on a research question opens up new knowledge and enriches and contributes to the knowledge that we already have. These academic interests have brought me on a journey of critical analysis and reflection together with many wonderful collaborators. And we ask curiosity-driven questions on gender as we think about, carry out, and disseminate our research. It is good to know 
that at least in my experience, attitudes have changed over time. When I began my PhD in political science in 1989, a young man in my class asked me what my research subject was about. I replied that it was about exploring the influence of women's groups on public policy on women's rights in Ireland. His reply was, that will be a short thesis. I was at first taken aback by this remark, as I felt it belittled my research. But I was undeterred, as I thought that if this man had to dismiss my work in this way, there must be something in it that he felt threatened by. And perhaps it was the originality of my question. Today, anyone daring to make such a remark would be loudly criticized, to say the least. In my case, I'm very happy to say that this study is now the foundational reference work for the study of women's rights in Ireland. And the sex and gender question in my research continues to yield interesting projects, collaborations, and publishing opportunities. So the message is, you have hit on a very important question if people try to dismiss your work without engaging in it. As time has progressed, I have seen the gender question become more central to research agendas and to higher education. Um, gender equality is today widely accepted as a mark of excellence in terms of institutional reputation and quality of teaching, research and innovation. It is now becoming a key performance indicator, a measure by which universities and their research outputs are assessed. One indication of the rel relevance of gender equality to the academy and everything that happens in it is its inclusion in the Times Higher Education University Impact Rankings. These are the global performance tables that assess universities against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Introduced in 2019, the table on SDG 5, which is gender equality, measures universities' performances in three areas their research on the study of gender, their policies on gender equality, and their commitment to recruiting and promoting women. In 2022, from 938 institutions assessed on this indicator, the top spot went to Chiang Mai University in Thailand, and only one Western university gained a top five placing the University of Western Australia. For Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, only the International Uni University of Sarajevo has applied for this ranking in this category, and it is scored in the middle third um, of, of the rankings. This global attention to gender equality has not come out of the blue. For the past two decades, Progressive women and men in academia have promoted the adoption of gender equality as an essential institutional condition for teaching and research excellence. Their work has transformed university policies, procedures and practices. Today, the typical academic is much more diverse in terms of gender and other characteristics to the stereotype that we often hold of a, a, a single male carefree person who devotes their entire life to their books and their studies. Universities today either have or are under pressure to have policies on gender balance in decision making. They need to take gender into account in recruitment and promotion practices and they're required to support gender-based research and research that includes a gender perspective. Thus, 
Many universities now adopt a gender equality plan to address these issues, as we do in TU Dublin. Funding bodies, too, are increasingly looking for gender equality plans from the universities in the order to be eligible for funding. European Union funding is a case in point. In her preface um, to the 2021 publication, she figures, and I'm going to move back to the slide, um, charting the, uh, and the she figures charts the progress of women in academia and research across the European Union. The Commissioner Maria Gabriel said, the COVID-19 crisis has aggravated the social and economic challenges that the European Union is facing and has disproportionately affected women, including in research and innovation. However, we have an opportunity to shape the recovery to make it greener, fit for a digital world, and more inclusive. Women's full participation in research and innovation is thus crucial for Europe's recovery. There is no sustainable recovery if it is not gender sensitive. Now, that is a clear message to the research community, both the um, uh, PIs the, um, the, the uh, primary um, drivers of research and researchers themselves. And that includes students such as you. Um, that clear message is that women and the gender dimension must be an integral part of research and innovation. To aid us in that task, the European Commission has identified 130 subfields where data showed that a gender analysis can benefit research. These subfields range from computer hardware and architecture to nanotechnology, oceanography, geosciences, organic chemistry, aeronautics, space medicine, biodiversity, ecology, biophysics, and many others. The League of European Research Universities has been to the fore in publishing position papers on gender equality in higher education and research. And in 2022, made available online the member institutions' gender equality plans as a resource that anyone can access. So uh, if you look up L-E-R-U, LERU, and gender equality plans, you will come to them if you're interested. But why should we pay attention to the aspect of sex and gender in our work? The Norwegian Feminist Research Centre, Kilda, provides us with an answer. In their excellent booklet, What is the Gender Dimension in Research? Uh, Kilda says, and here it is, uh, it says, Integrating the gender dimension in research is an added value in terms of excellence. It helps researchers question gender norms and stereotypes and to rethink standards and reference models. It leads to an in-depth understanding of the needs, behaviours and attitudes of both genders. It also enhances the societal relevance of the knowledge technologies and innovations produced. The booklet then goes on to present case studies from research fields such as health and well-being, food, agriculture and fisheries, energy, transport, environment and, environment and climate, and safe societies. And, um, and as an aside, I have sent um, an an e-copy of the booklet to Amina uh, for distribution to you. So, um, so that's what Kilden says and gives us a good rationale for doing this. And this is very useful for you to have as well when you um, are asked or may be asked to justify why you are including 
uh, a gender uh, dimension in your research. Um, we also have a project called uh, Integrating a Gender Analysis in Research. And that project gives, also gives us a helpful justification as follows. And they say, introducing a gender-sensitive approach makes research and teaching of higher quality and validity by helping in making research results more relevant for society, enabling development of new research, teaching and career progress paradigms in research institutions, and that obviously includes universities, and enabling researchers to write more competitive proposals. So this is another very helpful justification for integrating a gender dimension in our work. Knowing why we should integrate the gender dimension in research is one step. Knowing how we can do this is the next step. The European Union has funded multiple projects supporting the integration of gender equality in universities and research organisations and promoting the inclusion of the gender dimension in research. These projects can provide us with tools to address these issues as we strive to deliver our excellent research. One example is the Gendered Innovations Project. It provides us with detailed worked examples from all fields on how gender can be integrated into scientific research. And I would uh, recommend very strongly that you look at the Gendered Innovations Project um, if you wish to explore in your own specific area how gender can be integrated into scientific research. We need the help that these projects give us because research has a long way to go to incorporate gender. For example, in a paper examining what needs to be done, the League of European Research Universities, or LIRU, as I mentioned earlier, pointed out that in medical research, 44% of publications on diseases prevalent in women did not report the sex of the subjects or specimens studied. Similar results are known from basic neuroscience and endocrinology. The result of this pervasive bias, both in preclinical and clinical science, is that medicine and healthcare, as they are practiced today, are less evidence-based the evidence based for women than for men. Eight out of 10 drugs that were, were withdrawn from the market in the US between 1997 and 2000 were found to have worse side effects in women than in men. So if nothing else, this is our own peers, our own scientific community telling us that the science that they and their predecessors have conducted is uh, biased and does not um, include its effects on women as fully as it should. Or, as the Gendered Innovations Project points out, and I know that's a little bit small, I'm sorry about that um, small uh, writing on the screen, um, many examples exist of stereotyping in design and engineering aimed at girls and women. For example, manufacturers often assume that shrinking and pinking a design makes it more fit for or attractive to girls and women. However, research shows that a pink and round shape in toys do not always appeal to young girls, or that adding fashion to video games does not necessarily make them more attractive to girls and women. At the very least, products that are designed based on stereotypes instead of solid evidence are likely to reinforce or contribute to gender inequalities. And that's a sobering um, reflection. If 
scientists do not recognize then the different physiological makeup of women and men, or if stereotypical beliefs exist about gender roles, innovations may be gender specific in ways that do not benefit all users. A, a recent, um, sorry, I've just skipped a slide, I shouldn't. A recent Oxfam report puts the matter clearly. Gender blind research is just bad research, it says. Not only does it risk undermining the reliability and validity of the finding and their representation of social realities, but it can also cause the programs, policies, and campaigns on which the research is based to reinforce rather than challenge patriarchal structures and gender inequalities. But for researchers who are not steeped in gender research already, it can be a struggle to tease out what gender in their context can mean and how one would go about operationalizing it. Professor Mary Hawksworth, a political philosopher by background, has thought about this issue and she provides us with a useful way of thinking about gender that can be applied to any research context. And she thinks about, um, about gender in, in a social science context, but she also thinks about it more generally as a research question. So she says, in a research context, gender is a heuristic device. In other words, a general concept that aids analysis. And this uh, tool illuminates areas for inquiry, it frames questions for investigation, it identifies puzzles in need of exploration, and it provides concepts, definitions, and hypotheses to guide research. So when we bring gender into our research, we are usually um, looking at all of those areas and addressing, bringing gender to bear on our questions, on our puzzles, and using gender concepts and hypotheses to guide our research. In some cases, depending on the research, this might involve taking into, the, into account the sex of cells and tissues something that, as I pointed out earlier, in many other uh, physiological studies, it was not taken account of. In other cases, it could be identifying the relevant sex-related variables, for example, the pain thresholds of women and men, or how male and female skeletal structures respond differently to hip replacements, for example. And in yet other instances, the research might call for thinking about gender norms, gender identities, and relations between genders. And there are some fields where integrating a sex or gender dimension is not as relevant as in other areas, such as in pure mathematical theory. In this case, the integration of gender is not about the subject matter per se, it's about who is doing the research? Who is getting credit for the teamwork? In this case, the kinds of questions that can be asked are, is the team a gender balanced one across all stages of the career path? And to that question, you will often find the answer is no, where uh, the men are the principal investigators or the professors in the area, and the um, heavy work is being done by female PhD students quite often. And then the question is, are the collaboration opportunities equal avail equally available to the women and men on the research team? And that includes uh, opportunities for going to conferences. Are they equally shared out between the uh, women and men researchers? Um, are women getting the same opportunities to contribute to multiple authored publications? 
and are they getting the right amount of credit for doing so? So these kinds of questions come into play in all research activity, but no discipline can say that gender does not matter to them because if it doesn't matter in the content of that research, it matters in the environment in which that research is conducted. There are, of course, different ways of integrating gender in research and different degrees in which it can be done, some of which embed gender more deeply in the project than others. And, and different projects require um, a different form of embedding. So there is no one size fits all in this regard. Oxfam have a very helpful set of terms and explanations that enables us to identify the degree to which a gender dimension is present or should be present in our research. Although it is designed for research on development issues, it serves also as a guide to gender in STEM research and is as follows. So here we have the Oxfam um, understanding of different kinds of research. And um, we have a research that is gender blind, where gender is not considered in the research project, not even in its conceptualization or its rationale. And I'm sure if you look around at it, at research that you know that is being done, I would be, not be surprised to find that maybe 90% of the research that you know of is gender blind. Then there is gender aware research, where gender is considered in the research project's rationale, uh, but not integrated as an operative concept in the design and methodology. So there was, in other words, there's some thinking about uh, the, the gendered nature or the gendered aspect of that research, but it's not carried through into the uh, further stages of the research. Then you have a gender sensitive uh, rubric or rule of thumb, where gender is considered in the rationale project design and methodology. Data is disaggregated by gender, and gender is also considered in the composition of the research team and indeed the reviewers of the work itself. Um, gender sensitive research does not, at this point, extend to analysis and action to address gender inequalities but it is nonetheless integrated into uh, the research itself. Then you have gender responsive uh, category, where gender is considered in the rationale, design and methodology, and is rigorously analyzed with a view to inform the implementation, communication and influencing strategies that flow from the research. So gender responsive research goes quite a long way um, to addressing gender inequalities, but it does not address the underlying structural factors such as the norms and power relations um, that contribute to gender inequalities. And finally, you have a category called gender transformative research, which examines, analyzes, and build an evidence base to inform long-term practical changes in structural gender power um, relations and norms, roles, and inequalities. Gender transformative research actually should lead to sustained change through action, and that could be through partnerships, outreach, and interventions, particularly with women's rights organizations. And I'm very sorry, Samra, that the text is not very clear. Um, I understand it's very blurry, but allow me to say that I have uh, shared the, um, uh, the slides with Amina, who will uh, share them afterwards. 
Now, can you still see my presentation? Because it's now gone blurry on me. <laughs> so I'm just checking to see if it's still okay from your point of view. Uh, I, I, I went, I went to uh, uh, look at the chat because I saw something coming into the chat and then suddenly <laughs> my own screen went dark. So apologies for that. We can see it's a bit blurry, but we can see. Okay, okay. I'm really sorry about uh, not being able to present this uh, uh, properly to you. I'm, I'm just hoping I can uh, just go back a slide. No, I can't actually present uh, anymore. So I'm going to stop presenting and try presenting again. Is that okay? Yeah. Or will I continue? Or will I continue? Maybe we can try, maybe you can stop but try and then try again. Okay. Okay. And I will try again. Present. Okay, can you first open the presentation and click F5? and then share the screen. Maybe then it will function. And uh, uh, click F5. Uh, and then share the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm going to stop. Uh, I want to close that. So let me open my presentation. I'm sorry for this. Open my presentation again. Just taking a moment. Yes. Okay. Now I will click at five. Mm -hmm. Yep. And now I will present. And it keeps asking me select a window or a screen. Yes, yeah. select a window for the presentation. Now, is it it's not coming up? No. And it says I'm sharing an application. So whatever I did there has really messed things up. <laughs> Oh, that's very frustrating. Um, so it hasn't. It hasn't. No. No. Go to. Tell me that I'm still sharing. That's my problem. Okay, then stop sharing and just try to share it again. Yeah. Uh, it, share your screen and the error has occurred when screen shared. That's what's happened. That was the message I get. I can't share my screen. Okay, so I can do it maybe. Do you want me to put um, the presentation? Yeah. And to have it please. okay. Yes, I will. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your patience, everyone. You're very, very tolerant. It's okay. Those things happen when it comes to the technology, so it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I will share it in a minute just to open it. And it probably will look much better with you sharing it. Anyway. We'll see, yes. Okay.
Can you see it now? Oh, it's something is looking good. Is it better? And I'm sure it will pop up. Um, now, I can't see anything, but it doesn't matter <laughs> can uh, that see? I can't see anything, but uh, can people? Sandra, can Maybe you see the presentation? Maybe there's a long line, though, can't see. Can you see it now, the presentation? Anyone, anything? No. No, I'm afraid not. Nothing? No, we see. Uh, oh, oh, no, all we see is a nice photograph. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll stop sharing and try again once more. I'll try again opening the presentation. Let me go. No, not coming up yet, uh, Amina. Not coming up. Anything now? No. Maybe I can try with my phone. That's the only way to try it again. Not. So okay, far. I'll try with my phone. And that's the only way I can try to do it again. Okay. Can you see us now? Uh, we, we can see uh, the classroom. Yeah. You can see the classroom, good. Because we don't see you here. Oh. Okay. I can share it through my phone. Okay. I think is it. I don't know. Is it better? Can you see it? Uh, it yes, I can see it. Uh, Samra, you can see it. I guess. Uh huh. Uh, so we were on the slide with the orange. Yeah, and, and it's probably uh, a better. Uh, it's probably easier to see now. So. Okay. That's a great solution, Amina. Thank you so much. That's You're absolutely right. wonderful. Great, great. Just go on. And so I will tell you then, um, Amina, when we change slides. Is that okay? Because yes. you have to do it now. Yes, of course. Just tell me how it is. Perfect, perfect. So we have this classification from um, Oxfam. And when I read this classification, it was then meaning to reflect on the integration of sex and gender in my own research. And it occurred to me that um, I have um, conducted, certainly I have conducted gender of, um, aware and gender sensitive research. When, uh, um, I have used female and male as um, a sex variable in opinion surveys or electoral studies. 
And this, using this um, approach, was relevant in a number of research projects related to public support for gender equality. For examining the, the extent to which electoral rules held a gender bias, or for seeing if voters are more likely to support male over female candidates. So in these works, um, they had elements of gender aware and elements from the gender sensitive categories. In other research, I have used gender rather than sex as an organizing principle, an analytical framework, and as an interrogative practice. Such as when my colleague, with my colleague, Dr. Sarah Clavero, we constructed a process-based methodology for examining the gendered nature of democratic decision-making. It was highly revealing in its findings and showed us that taking this gender-sensitive process-based methodology to the study of democratic politics uh, examined, um, our, examined the quality of democracy and added fresh insights to standard studies of gender, uh, of democratic politics more generally. And although we completed this research about 10 years ago, it has stood the test of time as a solid example of how integrating a gender perspective can bring additional rigor with excellent results. So I would probably class this work as in the gender responsive category. Similarly, our work on a project with a focus on identifying areas of action for gender equality in higher education, a project called SAGE, would fall into the same gender responsive category. And it was through that project SAGE that I uh, first uh, came to know wonderful colleagues in Bosnia and Herzegovina, including Mirza. So what about gender transformative research? I can point to some examples of that too. Our current project, um, led by the European Research Council, called Resistere, and it has many European partners, is looking at the gendered effects of COVID-19. This is one with truly policy transformative potential, as it seeks to influence public policy responses towards more gender responsive solutions to COVID-19 and its consequences. More recently, Sarah Clavero and I have published an article on analyzing gender equality in higher education, which rests on the concept of epistemic justice. Usually universities emphasize the principle of merit and not the principle of justice. We argue that one cannot have a meritocracy without justice. Otherwise, that meritocracy is biased towards the dominant or powerful group or groups, and this undermines the whole concept of merit. This is a challenging argument for higher education institutions to address, and for current gender equality plans produced by these universities to integrate into their analysis. Again, this thinking and research has transformative potential not least by changing the way we interrogate gender equality in our organizations. So as a researcher, I feel quite comfortable working to integrate gender in different ways, depending on the nature of the project. Not all the work one does can be at the transformative level, and nor can be it can be transformative um, all of the time. The important point, though, is that integrating a sex and gender component in research makes for more accurate observations of our world, whatever our discipline and research fo focus, and therefore better science, better research. Integrating gender in research then 
can bring the researcher on an unexpected and exciting path. This is what Mario Chavez Claros from Colombia found. And we can go on to the next slide, uh, Amir, please. Yes. When he, um, as a newly qualified researcher, undertook a study of public transport crime. Here are his words. The results of the research were somehow predictable, but one aspect of it was shocking. While most people said the experience of riding a bus was chaotic and insecure, something unexpected popped up. All female participants said they experienced some kind of sexual harassment. These results especially surprised me. I guess as a man, I am not usually aware of all the problems women have to face. So I expected common crimes, such as robbery or theft, to appear in the result as the main issue to be resolved. The results may have surprised this young male researcher, but every woman will recognize that experience, and some men too. The example actually shows how important it is to begin to think about the gender aspect from the start of a project, rather than having it emerge as a significant finding in the course of or at the end of a research project. It is critically important then to consider the sex and gender aspects throughout the whole of the research cycle. Um, and, um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, before ruling them out as non-significant. This begins with the research ideas phase. And we go to the next slide, Amir, please. And I will be going through these um, um, the next few slides uh, very quickly, I'll tell you when to turn. Um, so um, the research ideas phase, and there's some questions around what to think about when you're thinking about your research ideas. And uh, then into the proposal writing phase, which is the next slide. And in the proposal phase, we then have uh, some questions here for thinking about the sex and gender dimension into that particular phase. And carried through the research phase itself, and we will go on to the next slide phase, you will have uh, questions that uh, you may wish to consider as relevant for your research. Um, in this phase, in terms of integrating a gender dimension. And finally, into the dissemination phase. And that's the next slide. And in the dissemination phase, uh, again, you are sharing your research with the rest of the world in different ways and you um, you need to uh, uh, be attentive to answering these questions too and uh, if one is taking a social science approach this all of this includes considering the interaction of sex and gender with other identities um, such as race and ethnicity uh, religion uh, sexuality and sexual identity, um, class, and other ways in which our society is uh, categorized, and in other ways in which people carry with them different identities. So, so there, um, and there are four slides on the stages of research and what kinds of issues occur at each of those stages. Um, and we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, because as Lehman points out on when to integrate gender, they say gender analysis should be used 
when cultural attitudes, needs and behaviours are important factors that may determine the study outcomes. Sex and gender can sometimes interact, most notably in biomedical research, which can demand complex analysis. Other factors may interact with sex or with gender or both, such as socioeconomic status, age or environment, and may diminish or amplify sex and or gender differences. Researchers need to consider and measure relevant factors and use them appropriately in the analysis. So, uh, so uh, that, that's advice to us. An article in Nature in 2019 discussed the potential for sex and gender analysis to foster scientific discovery, improve experimental efficiency, and enable social equality. Five scientists showed how incorporating sex and gender could improve experiments, reduce bias, and create opportunities for discovery and innovation. The examples they used show that including sex and gender has led to advanced understanding in diverse fields. From male and female shellfish responding differently to climate change, to gendered social robots, and to artificial intelligence computer vision improvements, prompted by evidence that facial recognition systems misclassify the sex of darker skinned women more often, more often than lighter skinned men. Um, in this particular article, uh, the five scientists offer us two decision trees to help us in considering the sex and gender dimension. And so if we have the decision tree uh, on sex, please, which is the next slide. Thank you. Now, um, again, this is a little bit small, and I apologize, but I wanted you to, uh, to see it and to see uh, what it could mean. So this is sex analysis and reporting in science and, <coughs> and engineering. And you can see that a number of questions are asked along the way. Um, and, uh, and if the answer is no, then nothing happens. If the answer is yes, you continue down the decision tree um, until you meet either a no, and, and at the second no, you actually go re report at the end when sex differences do not exist. And that's a finding in itself because that shows, if nothing else, that you have thought about the question. But when um, a, a, a difference exists, when the data is disaggregated by sex, you then continue on through the decision tree. Um, and you have the reference there, so you can look it up yourself, you know, up, up the full article. And then they have the slide on gender. And that's the next uh, slide. Um, and this is gender analysis. And again, it follows the same idea. Will the phenomenon or product under study involve humans? And if the answer is no, that's fine, that's a stop there. But it doesn't stop that group from being uh, interrogated in terms of what the team, what kind of team makes up that research project. Uh, and then you go through the decision tree answering the questions um, and if the answer is yes you continue on down if the answer is no um, where differences and overlaps exist where data are disaggregated uh, by gender if the answer is no you report when gender differences do not impact research but it shows that you have taken it into account as part of the rigor of your analysis. The answer is yes, then obviously you have uh, different um, results uh, to record. And those two decision trees um, can be helpful in thinking about uh, integrating gender and sex into research. So I am going to conclude now by, and I hope 
that my reflections on the integration of sex and gender in research will encourage you to think about this in your own work. <clears throat> Questions on sex and gender, I hope, will feed your curiosity and lead you to exploring interesting research avenues, whatever your discipline. Opening yourself to the gender dimension in research and innovation will lead you and your research teams, that I am quite sure some of you will lead in time, to producing research that is more scientifically sound, socially relevant, and life enhancing for everyone. So my advice is to embrace your curiosity and commitment to excellence in research and make it work for a more gender equal work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for putting up with the electronic glitches that we have experienced. And I look forward to listening to your thoughts and learning from you on how you think of and integrate gender in your research. Mm -hmm. So, so that uh, is uh, my thought that I share with you today. I and just pause here to see are there any questions? Okay, any questions? I'll turn on the mic. Also, girls online. Yes, of course. Or it doesn't have necessarily to be a question, it can be a reflection, it can be a thought, it can be something that struck you as I was giving my presentation. Maybe I can. Okay, Amina, go for it. Uh, through all this time, I was thinking how to incorporate all those gender norms in our works. And those two uh, last two slides are really good because we can see uh, questions that we should ask in order to figure out can we incorporate that norm or not in our work. For me that was so useful, I will save the slides definitely for my works uh, in future. That was really good, so helpful, so thank you for that, for sharing with us. Because I didn't have a chance to see it like that. All explanations for me were too much before, but those last two slides are amazing, so thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, that, I will let me uh, let you in on a secret, mm -hmm. and that they help my research hugely too. <laughs> so, really? so when I saw these slides, when I came across uh, that uh, article, uh, I thought, oh yes, this is what I have been doing for 20 years or more. Now it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so I had it before, but earlier than you. In my early yes. days also. Great. Yes. Great, great. Somebody wrote us something, I think. So I said, great presentation, thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. Um, I, I tell you what, will we have a little break now? We said we were going to have a break. Yes. So will we have a little break? It's now um, uh, 18 minutes past the hour. So if we come back at 30 minutes past the hour, is that enough yes. for everybody? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's okay to have 10 minutes break. Good. Or we can have longer if people want. Okay. I don't mind. Okay. It's okay, 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we come Good. back at half past the hour. Then. Good. See you in 10 minutes. Great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.